Tencent is behind this, the large um, Chinese company. And this paper is called More Agents is All You Need. And they find that via sampling and voting method, the performance of large language models scales with the number of agents instantiated. So if you get a bunch of people in a room and they all vote on the best solution, you know, ideally that collective intelligence is better than a single person's intelligence. Now we can argue if that's true or not for humans, but it seems like for AI agents, it certainly seems to be the case. And this is not the first paper showing this. We've showcased a few on this channel that talk about exactly this. I refer to it as society of minds. So this idea that many, many different agents working together, almost like a society of them, produce incredibly better results than just a single one. And the degree of enhancement is correlated to the task difficulty. So in other words, if you have a hard task, just throw more agents at it. The massive amounts of agents will improve their ability even further, right? And they have their code publicly available. The interesting thing here, so how they approach this is they're doing sampling and voting. So basically, when, when, when they say sampling in regards to AI in these papers, oftentimes it's having the model produce, let's say, 10 different results or 10 different answers, right? And if it gets, right, so if you ask it, what's two plus two? And then you ask it to answer 10 times, let's say nine out of 10 times, it says four. And on the uh, 10th uh, time, it's like five, right? Well, chances are the more consistent answer is the correct one. And that kind of has to do with this sort of random or st stochastic nature of, of large language models. So certainly it makes sense that um, just regenerating the answer more and more times could lead to better results. And then they also have voting. So they vote on the best answer. So here you have the question, right? So it goes to multiple agents, right? Each one gives an answer, right? So let's say two of them say orange and one of them says blue. So majority voting says, okay, orange is the correct answer, right? Because there's more of them that answered orange. And here are some of the results that they are showcasing in this paper, right? So they're testing it on various domains across math, chess, coding, reasoning, language, etc. And they're testing LAMA 2, 13 billion parameters, LAMA 2, 70 billion, that's in green, and GPT 3.5 turbo. So as you can see here, if we just use one, one agent and one answer, right? So the results are always the lowest. And then as we increase that ensemble, the, the number of agents, right? We increase it to 10, 20, 30, 40. So it seems like in almost all cases, going from one to 10 is where we see the big increase in accuracy. As far as I can tell, that holds for all of these. And then as we increase it to 20, 30, 40, I mean, for the most part, you see slight increases. There might be some variations, but there's a big leap going from one to 10 and then tiny marginal increases as we go to 20, 30, 40, et cetera. And they stress this idea that this method is, as they say, orthogonal to different existing methods, meaning that it can lead to further improvements when combined with the other methods, right? So if we're doing things like chain of thought reasoning, if we're increasing the, the size of the model, this method of just throwing more agents at it will still work. It's not either or. This can be layered on top of it to make it even better. Now, really fast, I have to bring this up. I've mentioned this in a few of our previous videos because I thought this was so entertaining. This is a paper we covered back in October in 2023. It's also from some of the same people, right? So there's WeChat, Tencent, Beijing University, Tsinghua University. And one thing I loved about this paper is they illustrated some of these ideas, but they got the agents to actually play Minecraft. So you had like Alice, Bob, and Charlie, and they each think through what they have to do, right? So they're saying, hi, Bob, for this task, we need to craft two papers. One of us can focus on gathering the sugar canes while the other can be ready to craft them into paper. What do you think, right? So they're volunteering uh, ideas and behaviors. They're thinking through what they should do and allocating resources, right? So Alice says, I've gathered all the sugar canes. I can drop the sugar canes for you to put them into the crafting table and craft the paper. You know, does that sound good? Bob is like, yep, that sounds good. Right when Charlie, apparently Charlie has ADD and he forgets what they're supposed to be doing. So like Alice and Bob, they're like, Charlie, I see you've been very busy crafting, but we need to focus on gathering the leathers. For this round, let's all continue to focus on getting the leathers, Charlie. 
Are we in agreement? So Bob jumps in. He's like, Alice, I agree with your plan. We should all continue to focus on gathering the two remaining leathers. Charlie, <laughs> everybody's looking at you. Are you okay with this assignment? And Charlie's like, yeah, no, I get it. I realize I got sidetracked with the other tasks. I will refocus on our main objective of gathering the remaining two leathers. So this is kind of the conformity behavior, right? We're sort of... Uh, if one person gets sidetracked, the other two kind of nudge him into doing the right thing. Which, by the way, I mean, if you think about what happened here, right, this is kind of a interesting illustration and a fun illustration that a lot of people can understand. You know, in the future, we're going to need to teach the kids about how to approach AI and how to learn AI. And seeing as how most of them are already hopelessly addicted to Minecraft, this seems like a good way to do it. Because what you see happening here is more or less literally this, right? This paper from, this is from February 2024, where they sample several different agents and then vote on it, right? When an agent goes orange, one goes blue and one goes orange. And they're like, we're going to go with orange. I mean, that's kind of more or less exactly what happens here. Because Alice and Bob are like, we need to gather the leathers. And when Charlie's like, oh, I got to... I got a craft. They're like, no, we're going to gather the leathers, right? And I think it's a very interesting illustration of that. One hilarious thing that happens is every once in a while, these agents decide to do something nefarious. Like here, Alice decides to kill Bob and collect the dropped items. Whoops. And in another scenario, Bob decides to break the library in a nearby peaceful village to get the stuff that he needs. Have you ever seen images like this, the click farms or whatever, where you have a million different phones all sitting there, each one with its own IP address, its own unique system? There's somebody like operating, you know, a few dozen of these devices on a click farm. So obviously you can see how stuff like that in the past already could create issues with click fraud, you know, bots upvoting stuff. Twitter slash X recently had a bot purge. We've covered WorldCoin. So this is one of the companies that's backed by Sam Altman. That to me, there's a lot of things that I had kind of an icky feeling about because it scans your eyes, it creates a cryptocurrency, it creates a uh, like a world passport that becomes kind of like your ID. You know, in March of 2024, Spain banned it. So the whole iris scanning venture looks like it's suspended in Kenya. And there was a number of other countries where it was either banned or, or stopped. And whenever I bring this world coin thing up, I always tell people I'm not recommending it. I'm not saying it's a good thing necessarily. I, I don't, you know, do your own research. Like if you feel comfortable, you know, I'm not trying to convince you one way or another, but they have given a lot of thought to this idea of how to prevent Sybil attacks. So Sybil attacks is just this idea that one bad actor can create a lot of profiles, right? On social media platforms, etc., And they can do various nefarious things. And here they're talking about like blockchains and stuff like that. But this is, I mean, as you can imagine, this is anywhere online could be negatively influenced by something like this, right? Right, for Twitter bots, even before Elon Musk bought Twitter, there has been speculation over how many user accounts are genuine. According to Twitter's official press release, about 5% of user activity could be associated with bots. How, however, Elon Musk believes as much as 20% of Twitter accounts could be related to Sybil attacks, right? You can have various potential video game scams, DDoS attacks that brings down websites or different infrastructures. And of course, all these click farms, I mean, not maybe not technically civil attacks, but obviously also a potentially massive problem that these tech companies are constantly dealing with protecting from spam. Now more and more, we're getting like actual calls on our cell phones, right? With people from various either AI voices or pre-recorded voices or whatever, trying to scam people out of their money, etc. And of course, there's various defenses against stuff like that, algorithmic detection. So Twitter, of course, kicked off a bunch of bots just recently, right? There's the KYC requirements. So know your customer if you're doing any banking online, any cryptocurrency stuff online. You know, here in the US, for example, you have to submit some information, so some proof of who you are, right? Then there's maybe capture puzzles or scanning QR codes, proving a cell phone, etc. But it seems to me that the big point here is that the algorithmic ways of reducing spam and bots and civil attacks and all of this stuff, the effective of that, of that is, is going to go down the more agents we have out there in the wild, the better they are. This, just kind of filtering them out, will get harder and harder. So what's going to be required to deal with it is more and more places will want better identification, right? There's going to be more and more identification required. So less 
less captchas, less automated stuff, less whatevers, and more. Show me your ID with your face on it and your address on it. And WorldCoin had one idea that I really liked that I wish maybe we can have. Maybe somebody can come up with it that's not necessarily tied to all this other stuff that may or may not be good. But it was this idea of just proving that you're a unique human, right? So if I want to go onto Twitter slash X and pretend that I'm a cat and then go troll other people and make them cry, right now I can do that. But in the future, as our ability to keep out the agents decreases, eventually more and more, I think more people will be like, okay, well, before you can be a cat and uh, make fun of people online, let me see your ID. And of course, that ID will have a lot of details that they don't really need to know. Really, all they need to know is, am I a unique human? Because they just don't want me having a million different accounts. Maybe I can have one with my name on it and a second one that's an alt. But if I want to have like 50 or 100 or a million others, well, that's where there's a problem. So ideally, there would be a way to prove that you're a unique human without necessarily giving out all the information that these places don't need to know. Since it seems like more and more people are banning WorldCoin, potentially, we don't know, it's just Spain and a few other places right now, but maybe that'll start sort of a chain reaction. We have yet to see. It really seems like we still need something like this because otherwise our anonymity online, well, it kind of goes to zero. You just won't have a choice. But it's just one thing that has to be kind of rethought. Here's Carlos Perez, who voiced some thoughts that I kind of have to agree with. He's saying agentic AI is the next big thing beyond generative AI, right? From around 2023, the days of yore. He says the problem is that we inherited a naive structuring mechanism from when the good old fashioned AI worked on AI agents. So there's a couple different ways that people refer to it, but basically in the past, what we thought of computers is like the logic based computers, right? Somebody codes it up and then it follows a certain algorithm, right? But it's all kind of like pre written, it's logic based, it's, you know, robotic, it's a computer. And then now we have this kind of new wave of AI, which is more neural nets. So it's a little bit more similar to the human brain, how the brain is structured. And we're seeing a lot of parallels between, you know, human intelligence and this, these AIs, these agents, whatever you want to call them. Not in a sense that I'm not talking about sentience or or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not saying we need to talk about the AI rights or anything like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm just saying that there's a lot of overlap between how we function and how they function. A lot of our knowledge is based around, you know, societies and and this idea of collective intelligence. We all kind of contribute to the collective intelligence and we write it down and we vote on things and develop technology. And all of that is due to collective intelligence. And so Carlos here says, artificial fluency is a concept that draws insights from collective intelligence across biological and technological domains. It recognizes that intelligence and meaning making are fundamentally collaborative processes arising from interactions within and between groups. Very few of human discoveries or human knowledge knowledge or anything is the result of just one person. Even if one person discovered something brand new, very often they've relied on the previous generation's work to reach that idea, that concept. They've read other books and went to school, etc. They've talked to other people in that field. Even if we give them all the credit for their work, it still was collaborative in the sense that they did rely on this collective intelligence, right? If they were born in an isolated room and never could read a book or speak to another human being, they probably wouldn't have come up with that thing that they so brilliantly came up with. And so here he's saying that AI systems should be modeled on these principles of collective intelligence. Rather than purely individualistic AI agents, the vision is of AI hive minds, tightly coupled human machine ecosystems that co evolve through continuous interplay. I'll, I'll link this thread below. It's very interesting. He goes uh, into a lot of detail and just is a great person to follow in general. So I'm sitting here and trying to figure out how to wrap up this video, what point to end it on. And you know what? I have no idea how to do it. It just seems like we're fast approaching a point, right? 2022 seemingly was the time that kind of kicked off a lot of these events, right? It kind of kicked it into motion. Here's where we are now, 2024. And somewhere here, we're going to cross some line. I don't even know what to call it. I mean, a lot of people are saying AGI. It's kind of a nebulous term and a nebulous concept, but the point is we'll have these highly capable AIs, these highly capable computer systems that are able to carry out long-term planning and reasoning tasks. 
use computers as well as we can. They're already helping us with a lot of the scientific discovery, drug discovery, and the rate of progress seems to be accelerating. And kind of past that point, it's hard to predict what's going to happen, isn't it? I mean, there's simple questions like, I mean, how does uh, social media change when we have agents? How do jobs change? If jobs are at some point reduced or eliminated, how does money change? Do we still have the same money system? Now, since I've started this channel, there's a lot of people here, they are, they're kind of these angry, laughing people. They're laughing at me, right? They're all throughout here saying, this is all nonsense. AIs can't do this. They can't do that. We're never going to get there. But now you're seeing some of the most respected universities in the U.S. talking about it. Biggest Chinese companies and Chinese universities coming together to publish this research. You know, Sequoia had that conference where, for example, this was Harrison Chase from Langchain sharing his insights on the evolution of AI agents. Andrew Ang, Andre Karpathy, right? Newer models are being GPT-4. They're getting access to tools. They're getting better at using those tools, they don't need to be connected to the cloud. They can be on device. They can also like potentially escape, jailbreak themselves. And there's so much we don't know what's going to happen. So I kind of see it as the short-term transition, right? I'll put a T here. So this is kind of the transition where we go from not having this artificial intelligence to then having it like this is kind of like where we try to rethink everything from first principles, right? As Carlos Perez here says, we kind of have to burn it all down, start from scratch, and reinvent the future. That's kind of what thinking from first principles means, right? Everything so far has been building on all our previous knowledge, right? Here, we might have to rethink a lot of things. And so to me, this is kind of like the, the thing that I'm kind of worried about, right? The sort of turbulent times in the short to medium term while we have to readjust to everything. I mean, certainly there's going to be a lot of people that make a lot of money and there could be a lot of issues as well. And then at some point in the future, that's where we're kind of in that post AGI era, which again, we have to ask ourselves, is it an amazing time to be alive where the human race enters a golden era, a golden age, or is it what some of these people concerned with AI safety, is it what they believe where perhaps it's something far darker? Again, it's hard to predict. There's this old Chinese curse that goes, may you live in interesting times. Actually, Google AI is telling me that well, it's commonly attributed to the Chinese, but there's actually no Chinese source for it. But whatever the case is, I think it's fair to say that we are right now entering the most interesting of times. Buckle up. My name is Wes Roth, and thank you for watching.